news and bad news of motivation is that we can't control another person's motivation. Like growing a plant, no matter how much we lecture, cajole, coax, or push, the plant is simply going to respond to its environment. What we can do is manage the environment. So what does the ideal environment look like for all of our motivated little sprouts? Happily, young people are not plants, and they can actually participate in the creation of the right environment for their own motivated learning. Today, I will share 11 key findings about motivation that underlie the UDL guidelines. The first few of these findings show us how little control we actually have in building motivation. Then again, our ultimate goal is not control, but expert learning, releasing the learner into the world ready to guide their own learning. Finding number one, rewards actually diminish intrinsic motivation. This is called the overjustification effect. Research consistently shows that if individuals with a high level of intrinsic motivation are given a reward for completing a task, their motivation decreases. A highly motivated reader rewarded for completing a certain number of books becomes less likely to read. That's not the result we want. One explanation is that people receiving rewards become more focused on the reward itself than the actual enjoyment of the activity. There is some evidence that this is less true when the quality of the activity is rewarded rather than just the fact of it. Finding number two, rewards stifle creative and flexible thinking. Not only do they negatively impact intrinsically motivated learners, but they also stifle the thinking of all learners. The classic experiment showing this is the candle problem. Psychologist Sam Glucksberg summarized the results saying that if a task is easy, then external motivators work well. If a task is hard, where the answer is not obvious, most new learning is like this, external motivators actually hinder new creative flexible thinking. The incentives keep you focused on ways that you've been successful in the past, rather than coming up with new ways to solve problems. Imagine a race with a prize for the first person to finish a sheet of multi-digit multiplication problems. For the students for whom that is already an automated process, they would be able to speed through. For the students who are just learning the process and may still stumble and forget steps, the prize quickly becomes a frustrating or misleading force. For the student who doesn't yet know how to do multi-digit multiplication, no amount of candy is going to teach him. This leads to our next finding. Number three, rewards induce behavior that students have the skills to accomplish. They don't teach new skills. Imagine our young math learner again. He knows that if he gets all of the multiplication questions right, he will get a prize. If he doesn't know how to do the problems, he is not going to get the prize. In the best case scenario, he will seek out help to learn how to do the problems. In the worst case, he gets frustrated and the prize itself, or the lack of it, adds to the frustration rather than motivating him for next time. Now imagine that this is also extends to the learner who works more slowly on math, the one who didn't eat breakfast, the one who has a hard time focusing or organizing the steps of a multi-step math problem. Finding number four, rewards only work if the desired state is seen as achievable. For the math learner who hasn't yet learned multi-digit multiplication, if they don't believe they can complete the math sheet, the prize is meaningless from the beginning. Finding number five, rewarded behavior only lasts as long as the rewards remain available. My guess is that if we find a learner doing math sheets in the corner in her spare time, either she's an intrinsically motivated learner who loves math or she's getting a reward from somewhere. Finding number six, rewards reinforce the idea that the rewarder, usually the teacher or the school, is the arbiter of learning. Finally, rewards diminish the sense that a learner is in control of their own learning. Learning and its reward becomes something doled out by adults. Let's pause here to think about the role of the motivated learner in the learning journey. We said that the purposeful learner is the steering system of the learning vehicle then the motivated learner is the fire that propels the learning vehicle forward. This is what makes a learner go anywhere at all. In order for the fire to exist, conditions need to be right. There needs to be spark, fuel, 
and oxygen. Let's dive into this, some of the research on how to design these environments that help students catch fire. Finding number seven, relevant shared goals establish purpose and guide learner attention and thinking. As we discussed in the last module, the power of a clear, specific, shared goal speaks for itself. A goal only promotes motivation, though, if a learner can imagine achieving the goal and they see why the goal is important. Build the answer to the purpose of the work into the work itself. As we are designing, we can pause and ask ourselves, why is this relevant for my learners? And how do I make this authentically connected to something they care about? Or even more practically, is the work important and why? Would it go in a museum? No. Would it go in the museum of this individual learner? How does it contribute to and show their thinking? Again, the learners themselves can be the best resource for this work. If we ask, they can guide us to make the learning more relevant. Finding number eight, mastery-oriented feedback sustains student effort and persistence. Feedback from the teacher should be geared toward honest reflection on the work and building a student's sense of and desire for mastery. Sometimes this feedback does more to define the true intent of a goal than the words of the goal itself. This feedback can happen both formally at the end of a term and on an ongoing basis through workshops, written feedback, how we respond to right and wrong answers, the types of comments and questions we ask of students, and structuring opportunities for peer feedback. Mastery-oriented feedback focuses on recognizing positive student efforts and strategies, encouraging student involvement and personal responsibility, engaging students in self-assessment, reflection, and goal setting, and emphasizing the value and potential of making mistakes. Check out the mastery-oriented feedback card in the resources for more guidance on how to frame feedback. The final step of feedback is to model and expect learners to incorporate feedback into positive strategies for future success. We need to create time for this and see it as a crucial part of learning. We want students to ask the questions, what did I get wrong and right on the assessment? What does this mean for my understanding? How do I improve my work? Seeing it more as a work of art or piece for a museum than as a test to pass. Finding number nine, praise of effort encourages intellectual risk-taking. Praise of intelligence discourages intellectual risk-taking. Many have probably heard of growth mindset, the idea that the harder you work, the more you learn and develop your intelligence, rather than seeing intelligence as a fixed, unchangeable asset. Carol Dweck guided much of the pioneering research in this area. Students praised for effort sought out more challenging work. Students praised for being smart stuck with what was easy. In the resources, there's a great video showing one of their experiments. Finding number 10, self-determined extrinsic motivators give students control over their own learning. A potentially important tool to develop the idea of a mastery-oriented learner is a self-imposed goal and reward for meeting this goal. This can even include finding ways to internalize goals that you may not initially find compelling. Because this is driven by the learner him or herself, a self-determined reward or even constraint takes away many of the negative effects of reward. It flips the dynamic of reward giving on its head Many expert learners use this tool as a way of designing a learning environment to best meet their needs as a learner. Finding number 11, collaboration and community give authentic external purpose to student work. Motivated learning exists in a larger social context, a classroom or school with a group of learning peers. Creating a motivating environment is not simply an interaction between a teacher and an individual student, we have all seen times when information, feedback, and support from other students is much more compelling than that coming from teachers, both in positive and potentially negative ways. Peers and the culture around learning may be the most powerful motivating force that we have to deploy. We can engineer opportunity for greater motivation through peer mentors, experts, leaders, strategic and flexible grouping, sharing strengths and challenges, public goals, support supported group work, giving and receiving peer feedback. We are captivated by the idea of solitary genius, 
the way students are assessed is linked to this same idea that successful performance is an individual accomplishment. Here are a few incredibly creative, motivated, high-performing individuals who made me think differently about motivation. It turns out that many of them are not just individuals, but pairs. Paul McCartney said in reflecting on his work with John Lennon, they had a habit of answering each other's songs. He'd write Strawberry Fields, Paul explained. I'd go away and write Penny Lane to compete with each other. But it was a very friendly competition. So many of these relationships intertwine collaboration, competition, and friendship. In many of these pairs, the two individuals were very different. They brought different approaches to the partnership. This was, in fact, what made them successful. The partnerships were built on a deep respect for the very different approaches, sometimes through strife and competition of the collaborators. This shines a whole new light on learner variability. Variability is not just something to accommodate or a design constraint, but a force to harness and use to support the learning of all. In the design of a learning environment that promotes motivated learners, we have so many tools, including establishing purpose and a goal, mastery-oriented feedback and praise of effort, self-determined external motivators, and the community of learners itself. Even the great behaviorist himself, B.F. Skinner, saw the project of education as bigger than on-time, on-demand performance of discrete tasks motivated by rewards. He said, education is what survives when what has been learned has been forgotten. The skills and dispositions that allow you to understand and guide your own motivation are crucial to long-term learning success. And we have the opportunity to design the learning environment to support the growth of motivated learners. Thank you.